Yo, yo, what's going on, everybody? Jelani Hashim Bracey, CEO of your favorite nonprofit, Black to Life, here with another edition of our Thursday B2L Kickback Series, where we have conversations that enrich and inform the black community. Uh, we uh, we want to address you know certain issues and and uh, certain things in society that we all go through as people, whether you're black, white. Uh, Asian, rich or poor, whatever. But we know as black people, uh, even though we all go through the same, some of the same things, we have to always throw our race into it because race has always uh, been a factor when it comes to this country with anything that we deal with as a people. So we want to, uh, we offer the time to uh, interview professionals that are around the area, black uh, professionals that are around in America and just to see their take on whatever the issues are of the day and you know we already know the problem so we we really want to bring people in that want to talk about those problems and uh, offer our solutions as well and maybe they can inspire some innovative and uh, creative uh, solutions within ourselves so without further ado man we want to get to this kickback got my first guest that's coming on I'm gonna get him in Got Mr. Brandon Watts. Dog, what's going on? What's up, man? Not much, man. How's it going? I'm doing good, bro. All good right, day man. today. Appreciate you coming on. Haven't said too much. Is uh, told everybody your name, so you want to go ahead. All right. Okay. My name is Brandon Watts. I am the executive director of Develop University, which is a a nonprofit for middle school age boys and girls here in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And I'm also owner of the natural resource brand. Okay, cool, brother. Thank you. Uh, where are you from, man? Matter of fact, are you from Dallas? I know you're in the Dallas area. Oh, God, no. I am from Pasadena, California. Pasadena, California. Okay, cool. Yeah. So what brought you out here? So I got out here to go to college. Um, the University of North Texas landed me here in, um, well, actually, I moved here in June of 2002, and I didn't start, I didn't start UNT until January of 2003, and okay. I've been here ever since. University of North Texas. Cool, cool, brother. So, all right, so we're going to get into this thing, man. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, what do you, uh, so what do you do besides, you say you were the, uh, you're founder and owner of uh, Develop University, and you're also the owner of Natural Resource Brand. Uh, we're going to go into what those are, too, but is there anything else that you do as well, or those are uh, your main things that you do right now? Yeah, so my... Like creative consequences, so we can stop suspending um, and expelling black and, black and brown youth so much. So we try to find... Um, restorative ways to reteach behavior, I guess. Like if a, if a kid makes a mistake, we make it a teachable moment instead of like, you know, you because you did A, you get B. Um, it's kind of like differentiated instruction, right? Like every scholar learns different. So we feel like every scholar is gonna have, um, learn from their mistakes differently too. So you have to have uh, kind of restorative ways to reteach behavior. I like that restorative instead of punitive, man. Mm -hmm. I, like, I like that. I like that. So, uh, so that sounds interesting, man. It sounds like you got a real passion for it. But how how did you get into that? Like, what motivated you to want to do this for children? It's crazy because uh, when I was going to UNT, um, I wanted to be like a juvenile probation officer or something. I don't know. Uh, but the same young American males kept coming into jail. And I would ask, like, why would they come into jail so much for truancy? And they told me um, because nobody in their schools, they, so they were in Denton schools, DISD, Denton. Um, they said nobody looked like me, you know, because I got tattoos, I'm, I'm tall, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so that's what made me want to become a teacher um, was so I can stand in the gap for some kids just to feel comfortable at school. Okay, so what made you want to do uh, and, and extend that to a, a mentor program with Develop You? Like, what made you want to do that? Okay, so when I was a teacher, 
uh, just some of the, the basics around character and problem solving and making good decisions. I saw very early in 2007 was my first year teaching, like that a lot of our kids were missing and, and not, not just black kids, but all kids, like some of the stuff, you know, our, us eighties, babies, nineties and stuff. Like we kind of learned a different way. Um, and I learned right then in 07, 08, like that we had to reteach character. So, um, Develop University probably started back in 07. It was actually called Boys to Men. I huh. I immediately had like a club, a group, like my first year of teaching. Um, and I took it to me with every school district that I worked in. And then I finally got um, registered with the state as Develop University in 2015. But I did it because I just seen this lack of character within these young men and women, young ladies, sorry. Young ladies. Okay, because you also have another program for them, right? Yeah, so Develop University is broken into two programs, which is Build, Boldly Unified. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we good. Okay, Boldly Unified in Leadership Development and LIT, which stands for Ladies in Training. So we serve 6th, 7th, and 8th grade boys and 6th, 7th, and 8th grade girls. And the reason why we do middle school is because, like, that's that forgotten age that probably needs the most love and hugs, right? And if you look at the data, um, between eighth and ninth grade is like the, the biggest year, uh, a big leap. So we try to give you guys, we try to give our participants the tools necessary to make responsible decisions when they're in high school and beyond. And ninth grade is the hardest year for transitioning African-American young men. Nice grade. a lot of pressure, man, because they might still be walking or getting dropped off while the seniors driving the car off, right? So people make fun of them. They used to be the big man as eighth grade, and now they're the, they're the tiny little freshman. So we try to give them the tools necessary to, to make responsible decisions, you know, in high school and, and after that. Okay, cool, cool. So do you, how many boys do you usually, uh, or and, and, and young ladies, uh, do you usually service on a, on a monthly or weekly basis, or however much y'all meet, like, you know, how the so we meet. Program. We meet our right now. We meet our we meet our participants just once a month, right? But next year we're meeting them twice a month. Matter of fact, we're going to be in two locations next year. So we're actually going to have a DU North, which is going to serve the North Dallas area, and a DU South, which is going to serve the South the South Dallas area. And we're going to have two programs running at the same time. So potentially. We're gonna have two licks and two builds running on the same times, the same day. And we focus on three pillars. Our three pillars are emotional intelligence, character building, and community service. We feel like if you are ingrained in those three, you will have the tools necessary to make responsible decisions and feel like a part of society, a, a positive part of society. Okay, yeah. I, I I definitely agree with that, man. It's about it seems like it's about the uh, mind change, which right. is going to change the mental, and then that's the way you can change the behavior. It seems like that's what you're doing. So, applaud you for that, brother. That, that that's a good deal. Uh, so you you spoke about uh, with DISD that you work in that system, and also uh, some of your kids go there as well. Your your children that you service, and with this pandemic going on. How has that affected your reach or, or your program's uh, uh, benefits right now with the coronavirus and the uh, shutdown and everything? Yeah, so it's, actually, so it's actually brought Develop University to a halt until today. Um, I've decided we are going into our character, I mean, um, excuse me, our community service sector, and which means we won't have to be in an office. We can be out in the community. So on June 6th, we are restarting our program with our with our participants, and we are going to have like a community cleanup, or we're looking for a community service opportunity for our boys and girls. We've been given um, somebody gave a suggestion about a garden, um, a garden project. But on June 6th, I'm trying to finalize what we're exactly we're, what we're going to do. We will be back with our boys and girls um, serving our community. Cool. Oh, and by when when you said uh, community, is there uh, is there a certain 
community, I know when you said South, is there a certain community South and a certain community North that you're focusing on? Or are you allowing, or are you like, no holds bar, whoever wants to, whoever needs to come in can, can come in? Yeah, I'm letting, so it's just, I guess it's just geographically, like what, whatever you're closest to. But right, right. right now we're going to be at the, excuse me, the Timber Glen Rec Center and the Juanita Craft Rec Center. So um, whichever one serves you closer, you can come join. Okay. So, but yeah, we're trying to reach all of the Metroplex. All of the Metroplex. So I would love Ooh. every district. I would, excuse me, my phone's breaking up. I would love kids from every district to be able to join um, either one of the programs. Okay, cool. But our man. maximum so, uh, right now is 25, 25 um, to 35 kids per program. So, like, if I'm talking about build, the max we can do right now for DU Build North would be 35. Just like DU Build, I mean, DU Lit North would be 35. Same for the South. Okay. Number game right there. Cool, man. Uh, so what do you think uh, – so how do you think this would actually benefit or help, you know, the, the, the black community in, 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 uh, in general? Yeah, so our first pillar is emotional intelligence. And if you don't know what that is, um, that is awareness of self and awareness of others. And not only awareness, but a plan, um, a plan in place for like when you do feel anxious or when you do feel angry. I think in the black community, that is ignored all the time, right? So a lot of times I found a lot of our boys was being suspended because they didn't have the, they didn't even have the verbiage to explain what was going on when they was angry, right? So with emotional intelligence, First of all, we're going to build your emotional vocabulary. That's number one. And two, we're going to give you a plan in place when you are feeling angry versus when you're feeling sad versus when you're feeling excited versus when you're feeling frustrated. Like going back to the basics, kids need to be taught what to do because they're learning probably negative, more negative ways to handle anxiety or frustration or even when they're excited they might like the reactions aren't matching the size of their problem or and the reactions aren't matching the size of you know whatever's making them happy like they overreact on both ends so emotional intelligence gives it gives them balance right like you got an a on your paper right that doesn't mean you go throw a party that night you know that means you you know give yourself a little pat on the back um you got an f that don't mean you flip over chairs. That means you got to figure out what you need to do to try harder, you know, to study harder or what, what, what you're missing. You know what I'm saying? So just trying to build that intelligence within them. And then when you talk about awareness of others, like being able to read others, other people's body language and, and tone of voice and know like, hey, you know what? I probably don't need to mess with him today because he don't look like he's having a good day instead of going and, and picking on that kid and then that kid blows up on you. So it's just making people more aware of themselves and, and aware of others in the same process. Cool, man. Uh, and also, and to your point, it's like, you know, us, as grown men and grown women, uh, we get over the level with our emotions as well. But we have been taught, yeah. we have learned through experiences uh, how to handle those with intelligence. And sometimes we don't do uh, a, a good job at that as well. So imagine a kid that has never been in that space and taught to deal with that. And the first thing is always punitive, like you're in trouble. Uh, right. Get you out of here. Get on you. You know, instead of trying to be, like you said, uh, restorative and build you up to let you know exactly like, hey, this is my, how you can deal with this in, a, in another time. But I love what you're doing, man, and uh, we really appreciate it, dog. Before I let you get out of here, though, I meant to hit you with the first question. I didn't, and I just, I'm going to end it with it uh, now. It'll be a little segue, but and uh, what do you feel 
like black is to you? What does that mean to be black to you? What does it mean to be black? Now, if you asked me that question when I was in, in high school, I would, I, I, I really didn't have an opinion because California is a lot more liberal than where I live right now, which is in Dallas, Texas. Right. So I didn't, I don't think that I've ever had to recognize I was black, black until I moved to the South. And what I feel to be black is I feel strong. Um, I feel very strong about who we are, just our presence alone. Um, when we walk into rooms, like we command attention. Yeah, and we don't have to say a word. So I, I feel very proud to be a black man in America. Um, and I'm not scared to be a black man in America either. So um, if anybody's out there listening, man, I would tell you to be, a, be proud to be who you are. Be proud of the skin that you're in. We are blessed to be black. And uh, we just got to keep pushing forward. That's a right on for me, brother. You know that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> man, you know that's a right on for me, bro. All day long, man. That's a good way to end that one. Uh, B, appreciate you, Brandon Watts uh, of Develop University. You want to drop your tag right quick on the uh, online and just tell everybody where they can find you, develop you, your natural resource brand, and everything about you. Right, right. Um, so, Develop University is develop underscore the letter U on IG. And uh, the natural resource brand is just like how it's spelled natural resource brand on IG. We also have websites. If you guys just go to the IGs, there's a link in, in the bio. Um, we are really excited about the natural resource brand because we have partnered with two schools, one in um, Valley View Boys, Valley, Valley View School for Boys in Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, Gwen Special Program Center in Plano, Texas. And a portion of our proceeds from, national, from, from natural resource brand is gonna go to those two schools. So they're actually going to have a, na a natural resource award given to their scholars every month. So um, we're looking to expand our brand throughout the country. Dig that, bro. Hey, when you get a chance, man, when you get off here, drop that in the comments, and I'll pin that so everybody can see that, man. All uh, right. Let you get up out of here, dog. I appreciate your time. Appreciate everybody you, John. Random bots. I appreciate you, dog. For real. All right, man. Peace. All right. You know, that was a great conversation, I believe. I thought with uh, Mr. Brandon Watts of Develop University and also the owner of the Natural Resource brand. Once again, Develop University is a, a mentoring and a program that offers uh, emotional intelligence, uh, restorative instruction to young men, and the Lit Ladies in Training is for middle school uh, young ladies. So uh, he'll put all, and the BUILD program, I forgot what that, was, that stood for, but build program as well and he'll put all those in the comments and we'll uh pin those for you if you're interested but the brothers out here uh really just trying to change the minds is what, what we're trying to do just change the minds and the, and the and the thought processes of our people of our of our community man and that's the only way we can actually uh make a change you got to change your mind first anything that happens happens in the mind so with that with that being said we got another guest coming up. Uh, this brother, good friend of mine as well, Mr. Uh, Michael Calvert out of Louisville, Kentucky. Waiting on him to ask me to join. Let's see if he come on through. Appreciate y'all, y'all coming out and uh oh there we go. All right. So we got our next guest coming. Michael Calvert. One of my what's up, what's up Johnny? Dog, I haven't done too much uh introducing you, but I'm gonna go, go ahead and let you go ahead and do your proper introduction, sir. All right, my name is my name is Michael Calvert. I'm a, a fifth grade teacher in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, uh, Jefferson County Public Schools. It's one of the well, it is the largest school district uh, in the state of Kentucky. It has close to a hundred thousand 
students in the school district, uh, 125 uh, different languages uh, spoken in our district. Um, <clears throat> about um, about 62 uh, percent uh, uh, African American in that school district. Yeah. Okay, 16 percent. Cool, cool, cool. How long have you been uh, an educator, man? Uh, I've been here since 2003, so this is my 17th year. 17th year, so it's pretty, yeah. uh, pretty much say you kind of like it, huh? Kind of enjoy it. Uh, I, yeah, yeah, I love it, man. It's it's been it's uh it's been uh quite eye opening for me, a beautiful experience, uh, being able to work with uh, work with the young kids, work with the youth on a daily basis. Uh, you learn a lot. You know, and you get the opportunity to touch a lot of people, touch a lot of lives. Okay. And, uh, man, so you've been doing this 12 years. Uh, how did you get into that? 17. 17 years. My bad, my bad. My bad. 17. Mm -hmm. My way I got 12 from my fault. Uh, so <laughs> how how uh, how did you get into it? Like, what made you motivated to, to do this, like, to your love for kids? Man, what, what got you into it? Well, actually, it started back when I was in uh, – I was at Russ College. I graduated from Russ College, uh, and I, I'm actually a mass comm major. My degree is in radio, TV, broadcasting. Uh, but um, one of my professors there, Sharon Goodman Hill, uh, she works in the communication department. Uh, one day, she had uh, our class where we had to volunteer at the Head Start Center, uh, right around the corner from Russ. And I really enjoyed doing that. And and my mom. My mom taught for 33 years. Education just goes in our family. My uh, my sister was, um, uh, at the time, she was a, a teacher's aide, um, my uh, my aunt, school teacher. So, it, I mean, it runs in the family. Uh, so that's that's how I got into it. I actually uh, was recruited to come to Jefferson County through a minority teaching program called ACES. Uh, it's an alternative certification because my degree was in radio TV broadcast and I was able to get uh, certified in education through this program where I had to work during the summer or I had to take uh, workshop classes, seminars during the summer and prepare for the practice exam for uh, uh, teacher certification. So that's how, that's how I got into it. Okay. Cool, man. Cool. Appreciate that. So with school, uh, so, so you've been on school for 17 years, uh, so is school out right now? Would it usually be out right about now, that, this time for y'all? No, we actually get out next week. So we've been doing what's called distant learning, uh, non-traditional instruction, call it NTI for short. Uh, uh, so basically what that is, kids are going online. We use Google Classroom uh, to uh, assign, and uh, we use Google Meet to meet with students, either individually or a whole group uh, if they need help. Um, so this is actually we, within the last week of school. So we only have like five, I think five more days. Yeah, we only have like five more days yeah. left. So, uh, I mean, it's been it's been an eye opening experience, you know, with the coronavirus. Some kids, some students, like in in school, they 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 didn't do too well, you know, like in the class every day. Some of those kids are really doing well with NTI. And some of the students that were doing well, you know, coming to school, having the teacher there working with them every day, they kind of, they kind of, you know, some of them kind of fell off a little bit. But, you know, it's 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 uh, it's amazing to me to see. I one particular student comes to mind. You know, it was hard to get them to do any work during the school year. You know, and uh, um, since he's been at home, and, and I know what the key factor is. The parents had to get involved with him. To make sure he's doing his work, so they they're holding him accountable too. It's not just the teachers holding him accountable. So with with the parents holding him accountable and the teachers holding him accountable, I mean he's been really he's been really performing well. You know, turning assignments, making sure he turn turning all his work, doing a great job too. So I mean it's uh and I know it's uh uh I think the school year when we start back in the fall, it's it's going to be pretty much the same thing uh, doing this distant learning. So um, 
it's it's a good thing for them to get the experience in doing it and for the teachers because a lot of teachers, you know, they haven't really haven't really uh had this type of experience going using technology so much. I was gonna ask you how how do you how do you like it? Like do you and you spoke to one of my questions I'm gonna ask you about the future of your school system. So you you see this kinda like as the new normal for y'all? Like do you see this progressing into the fall like you said? I mean, I'm not one of the people in charge, but I, I can't I can't see like for them to keep social distancing. Uh, if we have to do that in school, and I mean, there's no way with the size of the classroom and and up to some classroom has 28, 30 students in it. You know, it's hard the size of the classroom. You can't stay six feet apart. You know, so I'm I'm interested to see what the how how it's going to start back out, you know. It's it's been some talk about having um, uh, have uh, some kids come on on certain days and other group of kids come on another day. So I mean, it's it's going to have to be a new normal for school. It's, it's definitely going to have to be a new normal. It's not going to be like it was. Are you a uh, you know since you've known one way your whole teaching life? Are you against the change or kind of? Are you more of a traditionalist? Are you willing to go with the flow to see what's going to happen? But be an educator, any teacher will tell you, you got to be able to adjust. <laughs> I mean, from year to year, sometimes even within the school year, uh, you know, different programs come up, different ways of, you know, parents will say, oh, they're doing a the new math. Yeah, it's, it's a new strategy for doing math, you know. So we always change and innovate and trying to innovate how we educate educate kids. So it's it's, it's going to be a uh, you have to be flexible. I mean, you, if you're in the education profession, you have to be flexible and willing to adjust uh, to the change in times. You know. Okay, cool. Do you feel a uh, as as an educator? Uh, do you feel a response? Do you feel a certain responsibility or duty, not to your job but to your students? And when, if you do, what what is that responsibility and duty that you feel? Definitely, that's that's what actually motivates me more than the actual job requirements itself is the is the obligation to the students. You know, uh, it's it's a lot of things. You know, I, I you know you try not to take your work home with you, but sometimes you're concerned about a lot of things when it comes to these students. Things come up. I was uh, listening to the news the other day, and uh, one report said that the reports of child abuse has has gone down since since uh, the pandemic. But I mean, that's that's not necessarily a good thing because a lot of times those reports come from teachers, you know, someone out in the community that gets to see those kids, and those kids are locked in those houses all day for for it's been two months now with possibly a, a abusive parent, you know, those things are not getting reported. So, you know, those are those are things that you, you, you kind of concern yourself with, uh, you know, not being able to see the students, see signs of, because a lot of times students, some, there, there have been times when students have not felt comfortable bringing things to maybe the adult that they live with. They might bring it to a teacher, and the teacher has to go back and tell the adult or, you know, intervene in some other type of way or call, you know, some type of social worker or something in. So there's, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of drawbacks to, you know, this this pandemic uh, in, in that regard. Yeah, it has pointed out a great deficit and actually also in uh, like where kids get food from every day. Like, you know, oh, yeah. you never think about it like this. That's at least two meals a day if they get there early enough. You know, it's at least two yeah. meals a day. If you get there, you know, late, it's one. And but those meals are important, man. And we have to. Uh, I don't think people. Well, I know I didn't really think about that until it was mentioned. Like how many kids are, are going to go without uh, their their meals for the day, man, during this pandemic? But you know, it's like you caught in the catch twenty two because of a virus that has been reported and has been proven to do his thing and to ravage people, you know what I'm saying? It, it's been proven, so you don't want to put the kids in that situation. But it's, so it's yeah. like a catch-22, like what, you know, you want to please, you want to uh, kind of subject you to a potential, you know, harm. 
And uh, yeah. I think I think the school systems, uh, from what I've seen, because I have a son that's five uh, in kindergarten, I think they've done well. His school system has done an incredible job with the uh, online learning and uh, with the social distancing uh, requirements that we have with schools. So they've been keeping them engaged with projects and everything. So I, I really do appreciate. I just want to thank you uh, as an educator, man, for you know, taking the time out and, and changing up. Like you said, you've always had to come with the uh, innovative uh, styles and different changes throughout the years as a teacher because you have to adjust. So just want to appreciate you and thank you for that, man. Uh, got one more question, man. How do you think uh, what you do and or who you are, how, how do you think you and your skill set can benefit the black community? Like what, what you do now and what you also plan to do in the future. Well, well your, your guest said it earlier. Uh, uh, your early, your guest before me, I can't remember his name. What was his name again? Oh, uh, Brandon Watts. Brandon Watts. It he was. said it earlier. Yeah, he, he, was a, he was a school teacher and he knows the same thing. You know, a, a student actually said it to him, you know, that, you know, they don't see a lot of black males or people that look like them in the school, in the school building. I work in the elementary school. We're 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 like unicorns, uh, in in the elementary school setting. Uh, so that's 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 a big thing there. Just being able for a student to come in and, and feel like a, a a sense of you know relax a little bit when they walk in and see someone that looks like them, especially a black male. Uh, for our, our young boys, I, I don't mean to. Uh, I'm not trying to say our young boys, our young black boys, but I mean, I, I grew up in a single parent household, you know, with just my mom. So I um, I was lucky enough, I had a lot of black male teachers in middle school. And I feel like they helped shape and mold me to be the man I am today. So just being able to influence uh, uh, our young, uh, our young kids to uh, with character, teaching them, uh, like you said, a lot of things you just have to teach kids more character and how to be um, emotional intelligence. You know, teach them how to deal with those emotions because they might not see an example of that. You know, they might not see an example of you know a, a black man being calm and not showing rage when things are when they get upset or frustrated about something. You know, and, and sometimes I show that and I don't even know it. Like they can see like oh, Miss Cal is frustrated a little bit, but. He ain't snapping, you know, he ain't cursing and all that. You know, it's, it's certain ways you have to be an example and show show kids how to deal with their emotions. So I feel like I'm uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm benefiting the community definitely doing that, especially at, at my school. We're, we're 62 percent. We are 62 percent African-American and 14 uh, percent uh, Hispanic, uh, uh, Hispanic population. So uh, with that population, you know, I, I get to, you know, influence a lot of a lot of kids from in the community. Yes, and thank you for being that that positive uh, male image of a black man that is desperately like it, it ain't it needs to be seen. You know, it, it's out there, but thank you for bringing it to light and, and to taking the time out to being a pillar of the community in Kentucky and at your school in the education field. Really appreciate you, dog. Oh, right before you go, man, one more the uh one more question, man. What is it to you to be a black black, a black man? Like what does that mean to you? Or to be black, period. Uh I think I think that it has it has dual uh it has a dual uh side to it. Culturally, I'm proud to be black. I'm proud of my culture. I love it. Uh, but there's a, a, a sign of black as a race. And I, I look at black as two things. It's culturally black and it's racially black, how you see, perceptive, how you see by other people. So racially, the perception, I, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult, you know, how, how people perceive you, you know, even to this day, you know, I'm a big guy. I'm six eight, such such pounds. You know, I, I have a big statue. You know, I I walk in somewhere. You know, people 
instantly, you know, it instantly goes to intimidation. You know, I'm right. instantly intimidating, you know, being a black man too, you know, and, and, and it's sad that it's like that, but that's the way it is. But uh, like I say, culturally, man, I, I, I love, I love being black. You know, I, I, I most of all my schooling uh, from elementary all the way up to, to college, you know, mostly, uh, 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 you know, African American, uh, black population. I, I grew up in the Mississippi Delta, so all the schools there. Uh, I think I might have. I can count on one hand how many white classmates I had from kindergarten to twelfth grade. So uh, probably up until college too. Uh, I did do one semester, one summer semester at Ole Miss. Uh, got a little cultural <laughs> experience there, but other than that, you know, it was it was it was all black, and, and, and I love it. I yeah. absolutely, I absolutely love it and, and embrace it. Right. And and I, I and I, I constantly, you know, I take the opportunity in my classroom. Constantly, there's posters of African Americans all around my classroom, and you know, kids ask me, "Who is that?" You know, they might ask me, "Who is that person?" You know. I, I love to get those conversations started because, I mean, a lot of times we don't know, you know, the younger generation, they don't know how great our, our culture is, you know, how, how much great things, you know, we've done culturally against, against you know, oppression, you know, against uh, really going against some, some tough things, you know. And I always tell them, you know, you got to use those people to motivate you to do what you have to do. If they can do it, you can do it, you know. Yeah, and thank you for igniting that fire, you know, because like you said, once they see it, they, they're going to ask these questions about, you know, you got somebody on the wall, that, that must mean something. Like, who is that on the wall? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You don't, you don't just right. put people up on the wall. It's somebody. Right. So, yeah, and, and, and thank you for that, man, because to your point of knowing how other races may view us, the fact that you, you still love, and ain't going to be nothing else but African, you know, a black man. That's what yeah. it's gonna be like. That's it. And then, and then, and that's some power in that man. That can't nobody, yeah. can't nobody even take away from it. So, man, thank you for breaking it down like that, brother. Uh, yeah, my wife, my wife would tell you like, when I first came to Kentucky, man. I was culture shocked. I ain't been around so many white people in my life, man. Can imagine so. <laughs> coming from the Delta, so, Mississippi, yeah, and then all those, uh, HBCU. Uh, yeah, so it was. Yeah, man. Yeah, it was. It was a culture shock to me. <laughs> yeah, but you got through it, baby, because that's what we made of. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, yeah, but, yeah. It's not just uh, just adapt and, and and move forward. Oh yeah, that's yep. what y'all always do, brother. Hey, man, yeah. appreciate everything, brother. I appreciate everything you do. Thank you for teaching them kids, the babies, man. And hey, you keep on being a strong, positive role role model and black man image that these brothers and sisters need out here, man. We appreciate you. All right, appreciate it, appreciate All right. it Jelani. All right, dog. Roof. Appreciate you. Roof. All right, dog. Roof. All right, that was Michael Calvert, uh, fifth grade educator, 17 year vet of uh, education in uh, in Kentucky. My frat brother, as well as uh, Brandon Watts, our earlier uh, guest, and uh, also my chapter brother. Uh, Michael Calvert, we went to Russ College together. So uh, thank you, brother, for being out there. Just talking about him being a positive image uh, in these kids' lives as an educator, as a, as a black man in elementary education, but we're not, uh, too many of us are not in that field. But, you know, for the ones that are, we stand out. So I'm glad that brother stands out in a, in a great positive way. And uh, thank him for his time. So we got one more guest. And uh, waiting on my brother Keon to join us. It's also another brother of mine. Dog, what's up? Hey, what's up, bro? You all right? Can you oh, yeah, see I'm me? Good. You know my lightning be crazy sometimes. <laughs> I know, dog. I know. I know it. I appreciate you uh, uh, toning it down for the little interview for the night a little bit. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Let everybody know who you are, man, and uh, what you do, brother. 
Uh, I'm Keon Morning. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Yes Thrive, uh, the founder of Global Movement Beyond, and um, I kind of work as a more of a freelance chief technology advisor and a consultant as well. So been around for a while as a serial entrepreneur and working in corporations at the same time. So now I'm at a point now where that I'm focused on heavy nonprofits uh, adventures and heavy uh, entrepreneurial adventures with startups now. Cool. That's dope, bro. Uh, let's give a little more information on uh, Yes Thrive, if you don't mind. Uh, what is that? And, uh, yeah, you're a co-founder, so yeah, how you come about going? Okay, there? so Yes Thrive was, well, Torian is my founder. Uh, we founded Yes Thrive off of a couple of things. One was um, I've been in corporate for like well over 15 years in IT and tech, so I have always typically been the only black guy in these meetings, in these roles, in the department, right? So um, there, I've seen a big gap there as far as, uh, one, where the world is going, and then two, where that the skill sets were currently in the world and how that I could be relevant long term, right? So Torian is a principal, my uh, founder. So we brought both worlds together to kind of marry into STEM, which we focus on um, ninth grade males in high school to help them be exposed to STEM. So one of the ways we expose them is through um, actually hands-on learning activities, uh, professional development, and also, um, what is it? Um, healthy living habits. Yeah, I gotta keep that one straight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> bleed, the healthy living habits kind of bleed between wellness as well though. So yeah, right. but it's overall healthy living habits to what we try to focus on. Okay, cool. And, and what made you, you know, you say you've been in corporate for 15 years serial uh, entrepreneur so what made you get into the philanthropy side of the the nonprofit with the yes thrive like what what uh motivated you to do that well i got a rule uh because i had to take the game i got to get a game so um that's why i started a nonprofit, and because the way i paved my way through corporate to its highest level and never took on any management or vp roles and declined them because i preferred to stay like more as uh, employee working, but still having my freedom to focus on my entrepreneur ventures, right? So that's what it is. Cool. And that's cool, cool. So uh, with that and with the coronavirus and everything going on now, has this affected any of your businesses, even your nonprofit and your uh, other <laughs> ventures that you have going on? Yeah, in the startup world, definitely. I would say I've been able to raise capital still for one of the startups. You, it depends on what industry you're in, but I haven't seen too much effect, but I'll find out in the next few months, right? Uh, when it comes to actual Yes Thrive, it didn't affect a lot because I'm in technology. So I immediately started thinking to shift us to digital uh, virtual. So we ended up trying our first digital session. It worked out. So we was like, okay, it made sense, right? So that it didn't really affect us at all. But it did affect what I think the kids are so used to is actually seeing each other and the hands-on learning in person and just being able to get out the house into the classroom. I think that was a big effect. But far as my contracts go with corporations, yeah, they got slowed down completely, like, like completely. So, and, and it plays a, a, a role with a lot of things, but uh, I say that for the last question that you got, Norm. <laughs> okay, cool, cool, cool. All right. So, uh, well, with that, well, you know what, we can go on into that. So, uh, let, let let's talk about that. How uh, with this, with, with with your startups and everything, and, and just being in corporate for fifteen years, uh, have you seen race be a general factor in any of your uh, your progressions or or any hindrances you may have come up? Have you seen that? as a fact that you being a black man as the only black guy in the room? Oh, uh, no. But here's why. It's like sports, right? Your, uh, num your, your number one draft pick is never really affected when the team get the cutting, right? So that's what I was able to solve for with my skill set, right? So one thing we teach our boys is to understand how to become the best in what you're doing with your skills because you can stay relevant that way. But getting into STEM fields, definitely understanding which pathway actually keeps you relevant. Now, when you're talking about 
the race far as promotions or anything like that. I never really experienced that because those opportunities really were presented to me. I just chose to turn them down, right? But overall, for Black of America and corporate, um, racism is, it's funny. And it's funny in a lot of ways because it's like anything with humans. We run in circles, right? We run in cliques. So the cliques is what determines what level of racism you deal with and who's talking about you at what point, what level, right? And it doesn't matter which industry you're actually in. And it doesn't really matter your race because that's how we form opinions against each other, right? So that's, that's where I've seen a lot of racism happen at. Um, I also have seen a lot of racism just with myself, um, and this is going into the deeper end. When you told me, when we, you and I was talking, and you was like, you just make it look so easy. Um, <laughs> but the reason I'm able to make it look so easy, because in my mind, I understand as a black male, you don't have an opportunity. So if you don't wake up to create, you crying for an opportunity that doesn't exist. So we got to get out of our mind that these opportunities don't exist and create them. So that's why my model is create, you know, equity out of an inclusion inequality right so you take those opportunities and if blacks come together as one now you can start building that synergy to actually create these solutions solve the problems in your own uh community as well right and that's where the biggest gap is and and why we do experience racism and you know my motto it's beat them with our brain so um when you get into the tech world there's no way we there's no way we're not going to experience racism because the new racism is the digital divide. So now when you ask the level of racism I've experienced, I'm sure I've experienced a lot of racism with artificial intelligence, if that makes sense. So yeah, trying yeah. to get contracts, trying to talk to people, this robot sits in between you that these massive giant corporations own that, not, that are not black owned, it sets you back automatically, right? And a lot of people don't understand how severe it is because they don't understand what a psychological um, path of a computer will function like, right? So that's, I don't, you could put in a computer uh, algorithm that I don't want long hair, I don't want blue eyes, I don't want their skin this tone. We're looking for this specific level of experience and it automatically weeds everybody out. So that's where I'm seeing the next level of highly, um, I call it sophisticated racism. <laughs> and it's it's bad because it's playing into your social as well. They control your feed. Oh, yeah, your man. Feed. Okay. <laughs> I, I can definitely see uh, you see it all the time, but you're not. I, I know I wasn't paying attention to it like that until, you know, you just certain things do just come up on your timeline. You're like, where did that come from, man? Yeah. But, but like you said, it's algorithms and they reading us, man, because you feed them so much information and you know, they follow your patterns and all that. So, damn, I, I never thought about being racially profiled by the AI. Like, yeah, and, and it's bad. And, and it's, it's, it's to a point where we have to start defending our community now with our own systems. Because think about it. This video, you and I don't control where this go. It's not owned by a black person. But all of us use this content and put it out there. You see what I'm saying? So we have to start controlling systems, but social is not what I would call a requirement system that is needed in our communities. When I'm talking about systems, that's more like, how come we don't have our own elderly app for black community? How come we don't have our own job finding app for black managers that post these jobs in there, right? So you have to step the game up in the community to a whole nother level and take control of the systems. And um, that's how I ended up building a platform for a global leader, leadership forum because I realized that you have Watts with DU, you have us with Yes Thrive, but parents write me on Facebook asking for something for their kids to do. So the concept in my mind was like, okay, let's just build a nonprofit app, make this thing actually function in a way that people can find these services. So now you don't have to look, you can find everything on social, right? So that's how we have to think about the world, even from our own healthcare. You can't be rich and give a hundred million dollars to business that are not functioning, but you can't give a hundred million dollars to insure 10% of your population. That makes sense? An insurance company only buy insured bonds to insure they people, to insure us. So we got to start just thinking of the highest level now. 
Yes, definitely. Damn. Yeah. So, uh, so my so another question. Uh, what what do you think? Uh, your business, like, or your acumen, can give to improve or to uh, project the, the black community. So, of course, you know we're from the south. But <laughs> so, so being from the south, one thing I learned with racism, because I've traveled the world and been able to experience not just white um, American but European American, um, and you, it blew it blew my mind to be in some parts of Ireland and even see that. Uh, Irish and white American, Irish, Irish, European, white people don't get along with and like white American, right? So it, well, who is the problem, right? So um, one of the biggest things that I've been able to do is come up with a simple model to help startups actually launch and get funding, right? And the problem we have there is we don't know the true pathway and the money that we're chasing will never solve our problems. Because what can you do with a company that can raise 80, 90 million in three years? And you just made a million in one. You can't turn it around. So if it's, if it's more of us making the 90 million in the startups, that's where I'm, I'm trying to place my company to help these founders actually understand the process to go through especially when you build an app, you can't just jump out here and give your stuff away. You may have bad code and all that. Give them that pathway to success, how to actually raise money and actually get to their end goal with their products, right? And I'm able to do that because I have a consultant background coming out of IBM. So I've been off in some of your biggest clients you can possibly think of, right? So being able to bring that back into the community is where I see my company bringing the biggest value. And Thrive is what I call is going to be the nuclear where that we can grow our children in the community out of a future center that we're looking to build with Thrive and groom them into these same positions, whether it's going into the workforce. It doesn't matter the race of the company, but the skill set is what matter, right? And also grooming them on the path to be an entrepreneur if they want to take that path as well. And that's where I see my company making the most impact, which is GMB and some of my other startups are gonna make a big impact with health and fitness because that's the biggest gap. That's why I put this time in this fitness app the way I did <laughs> because I understood how unhealthy my community got a time into a fitness app to ensure long term if nobody uses it, we're gonna have a true system to stay healthy. Man, dog, that's that that that's really that, that and that's what it is about you know. We know the problems. We we can stake these all day, but to come up with actual solutions or, or plans and and things that we can actually do and project and see, that's what these conversations are about. So man, I appreciate you bringing bringing all that truth to us, man. All that that knowledge. One more question before you get up out of here, man. Uh, to you, what does it mean to be black? To be a black oh, a black man. Question. What does that mean to you? <laughs> Well, for me, I feel like Superman, <laughs> to be right. honest with you. I don't really dabble in how people see me as race because I'm testing your mind 90% of the time. So if you're dumb in the mind, I don't care what color you are. I, I, you, you can't even stack up no more, right? So I think we got to get to a point where we got to start challenging each other outside of skin. But as a black man, of course, I love the black culture. I do what I do for the black culture. It's the reason I went into technology to actually be able to build systems and bring them back to the culture. So I'm Robin Hood with the purple print for the culture. That's just how I see it. So, I mean, it's like I was telling people like in the pandemic, you really want to know what it feel like to be black? Try being the black guy, get three or four of your black friends to build a mobile app. We got issues in the community, but you can't get no funding. But you got tons of black celebrities who want to do all these events. But the solution is getting something to our community so we can know if they need tests or not, right? So I think those, it's, it's a different feel for me being black, but I don't take it into consideration where it stops my focus, right? So I feel like Superman, and it feels great to be black. And uh, I've been representing for the coach. <laughs> this is right. What it is. Yeah, definitely. And I appreciate you having me on, bro. No, I appreciate you, man. You know, you know, I'm be talking to you some more, man, because like I said, you uh you just you be breaking my mind to a jump like 
I'll be getting a jog and you bring it to a sprint. I'll be like, man. So yeah, I, I appreciate your, your counsel and just your, your inspiration, man, as a brother and as a friend. So thanks, mm -hmm. dog. I really appreciate you getting on here tonight, man. Appreciate you. Uh, anytime, bro. All right, dog. I'll be hollering next. All right, you too. All right, bro. All right, people. So that's going to be a wrap for the B2L kickback tonight, man. We had three guests, three wonderful guests, man. Uh, dynamic brothers of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. We had Brandon Watts. We had Michael Calvert. And we had Keon Morning, man. These brothers were talking about uh, so basically creating our own and like taking care of our own, man. We have Mr. Watts was talking about emotional intelligence with our kids, you know, to bring restorative uh, construction instead of punitive to them. And he's working hard with that with his developed universe and is also being an educator in the school. We have Michael Calvert also talking about bringing that strong black male image to our kids as an educator. He's been doing that for 17 years, so we appreciate him. And we had the brother Keon Morning. Uh, the last brother, that was in, he's in tech and also does Yes Thrive, which is a STEM program for uh, young uh, middle school children. And uh, he's basically talking about creating, man, creating our own systems, creating our own support in our own communities, man, by us. So three uh, dynamic brothers, man, really enjoyed the conversation. And uh, we'll see y'all next week, man. Thanks to everybody for joining and uh, I'm out. Y'all stay black.